This episode of The Bill and Callie Show is brought to you by Tiger Plumbing. Whether you need to replace a faucet, overhaul your sump pump, or de-sludge your drains, call Tiger Plumbing. In today's world, knowing who's at your door is important. Tiger Plumbing sends you your technician's photo, estimated time of arrival, and a little bit about him or her. Hey, Sam likes fishing and camping. Cool. Special Agent David E. Steele is a Federal Bureau of Investigation, retired, who spent 23 years with the FBI. As a special agent, he spent a large percentage of this time on the streets investigating crime, primarily white collar crimes and police corruption. In addition, Agent Steele was particularly well known for his involvement as a crisis negotiator for over 15 years. In 1996, he became a member of the FBI's Critical Incident Negotiation Team, a highly trained and mobile team consisting of the FBI's 25 most experienced and recognized field negotiators who are deployed domestically and internationally to deal with the FBI's complex and potentially lengthy hostage crisis incidents. Agent Steele has received multiple recognition for his outstanding work from the DEA, Drug Enforcement Agency, and the Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearm Explosive, the atf &E. In addition, Agent Steele has participated in the investigation of three separate cases involving the arrest of serial killers. One of these stories is being documented in an upcoming television special. Agent Steele has a strong bond with Valparaiso in Northwest Indiana. He has a Bachelor of Science degree from Purdue University North Central and his master's degree in sociology criminology from Valparaiso <coughs> University. Prior to his time with the FBI, he served in the United States Marine Corps and also 10 years with the LaPorte County Police Department. Today, he lives in Valparaiso with his wife, Nancy, and his two grandchildren. He has taught criminal justice at Ivy Tech Community College, Valparaiso, for 10 years. Ladies and gentlemen, please let's give a, a great round of applause to my friend, David Steele. Well, good evening, and thank you, Lynette, for that gracious introduction. Uh, it is an honor to be asked to be one of the first speakers of the program. Uh, I guess the downside may be after this evening, the series may be canceled. I'm not sure. Uh, I want to acknowledge also uh, our Chancellor, uh, Oso Zelowski, uh, who is not able to be with us tonight. He's doing something probably not all that important this evening in the country of India. Uh, he comes up with the darn excuses uh, not to meet with me. Um, I also want to express my thanks to Kimberly LeBurge and her efforts in communication and, and the news that goes out on these. Uh, distinguished faculty and students, thank you for taking the time to come this evening. Uh, friends and family, and especially to my beautiful wife, Nancy. Uh, we've been married almost 47 years, and truly she is the glue that holds the Steele family together, uh, and uh, more specifically at times, usually successfully uh, holds me together. Uh, because of uh, her strength, it allowed me to unexpectedly at times be able to be deployed uh, outside the country for up to four and five weeks at a time. Uh, sometimes she knew where I was going, uh, at other times she did not. So thank you, sweetheart. I appreciate all that. Well, this evening we're going to take a look at kind of two different things and we're going to kind of try to mold them into one. Uh, we're going to look at the role of the crisis negotiator in the FBI and then we're going to roll that into a critical negotiation incident that occurred in 2001 in the Philippines. 
Uh, that incident centered on the kidnapping of three American citizens, uh, Marsha and Gracia Burnham and Severo Guillermo, um, uh, by a terrorist organization known as the Abu Sayyaf. Uh, this presentation this evening is dedicated to the Burnham families, the Gamero families, and the many silent American heroes who fought to save their lives. In just a couple minutes, we'll be talking about the actual kidnapping, and we're going to move from the island of Palawan across 300 miles of open ocean known as the Sulu Sea to a small island at the tip of Mindanao called Basilan. Uh, we, we see it here in the one map, and then we see a, a larger picture of it over here. And so I just wanted to kind of give you an orientation of where we're going to be at this evening. Uh, a picture of Marsha Martin and Gracia Burnham on their wedding day. So we ask this question, what is crisis negotiations? And we find that it's the art and the science of securing the release of persons held in two different types of situations. The first situation most of you are probably familiar with, it's called the classic hostage uh, scenario. You've seen them a hundred times on television. Uh, persons held to force the fulfillment of certain demands, and those demands are usually of money among other things. Uh, the second type of situation is called a barricade non-hostage even though they're holding people. And, and, and normally they're holding people for not that they want anything but for expressive demands. And what I mean by expressive demands, they're about to express something which means that person is more than likely going to become a victim and normally a homicide victim. And so we see common criminals uh, who um, get involved in these type of things, suicidal individuals, other individuals with mental disorders. When we look at the role of the crisis negotiator, one of our first responsibilities, although it seems obvious, is to establish direct communications. Now, within the United States, that's usually not a problem. We just zip out our cell phones, hit about seven numbers, and we have somebody on the other end. Um, but in international negotiations, it's not always quite that simple. Uh, sometimes we use cell phones, sometimes we use satellite phones, uh, sometimes we use radios. In the Philippines, we actually use a radio station. Um, we will also use uh, newspapers. Uh, and other indirect forms of communication. Our first and, and most important goal is to establish proof of life. Um, we want to know that our hostages are safe and we want to know that they are alive. Uh, direct communication with the hostage would solve that problem, although many times uh, the hostage takers are not going to allow that. Um, a second means of uh, positive identification would be to take their picture and attach it to some type of dated document, like take their picture with a newspaper article that says June 1st, 2001, and so we would know that they were alive on June 1st, 2001. Uh, better yet is, uh, in some instances, is written communication by the hostages if we have someone who knows their handwriting. And then in the case of the Philippines, uh, we uh, we actually was able to uh, was actually actually able to secrete a video inside the Abu Sayyaf's camp of Martin and Gracia, which gave us uh, proof of life. We are concerned with the hostage takers' health. Uh, we are more concerned with the hostages' health, uh, and in a, again, in the case of the Burnhams, this became a major issue. Uh, we often, early on uh, in international negotiations, send a message to the hostage takers. Uh, we say to them that your message has been heard by the world. Okay. We acknowledge that you are holding hostages, but also remember the world is watching you, and the world does not condone the actions that you are taking. So if you want the world's support, you need to change what you are doing i.e. you need to release the innocent hostages. 
Oh, we try to lower terrorist expectations. Oh. We tell them that captives normally have no money, and in the case of the Philippines, uh, Martin and Gracia Burnham were American missionaries, uh, so we know they had no money. Um, the FBI negotiates ransom, we deliver ransom, but the United States government does not pay ransom. This is up to the captives, the captives' families, uh, the captives' business, in this case perhaps the missionary field, to come up with something that we can negotiate for. Because what we know about negotiations is, it's a process of give and take. And, and if one side isn't giving, it doesn't work very well. Okay. And so this was some of the problems that we ran into. Uh, team selections, of course in the United States, FBI agents, we just respond to Valparaiso or Gary or uh, Maryville, wherever there's an incident, local police, FBI is immediately notified. We respond basically sometimes with uh, as few as two negotiators, sometimes as many as seven, depending on how complicated uh, the negotiations is. Uh, when, we, uh, when we deploy overseas, we deploy with just a two-man negotiation team. Uh, and early on, the crisis negotiation unit will select team members from the critical incident negotiation team. Uh, and normally, the two-man teams, and we select three teams. And so and then we go into what we call a rotational system. Uh, we're, in, uh, we're in the foreign country for four to five weeks, and then we're back home for eight to ten. And then we're back into uh, to the country for four to five, and then back home. So. Team members, uh, the CIP, the Critical Incident Negotiation Team members, are uh, FBI field agents, so we carry a full caseload. So, uh, you know, I, I didn't negotiate every day. Uh, I actually had to go out and try to solve cases, um, sometimes successfully, sometimes not so much. Um, and um, deployments, uh, certainly uh, in, in, within the field of negotiations, have a tendency to add a little stress uh, to the agent because uh, they have a tendency to fall behind in their field work and really the supervisors in Maryville where I was assigned to, uh, th th they weren't really looking for excuses as to why I was behind in my field work. Um, they just wanted my work done. Uh, you know, they forgot that I had been gone for five weeks. You know? uh, so. so within the United States negotiations normally last four to five hours. Once we move out of the United States, we're usually negotiating for four to five months. So a whole different set of circumstances once we move out of the uh, national arena. If we look at the situation at hand, what we find is on May 27th, 2001, at six o'clock in the morning, we had the kidnapping of Martin and Gracia Burnham and Severo Gamero from a resort island called, called, called Das Lassimos uh, on the island of Palawan. The Burnhams, as I said earlier, who were missionaries, had been in the Philippines for 18 years. This was the first time in 18 years that they were able to get three days all together. And so they had snuck away to this little resort island to celebrate their wedding anniversary. In the ensuing 45 minutes, five to six Abu Sayyaf soldiers would kidnap 17 people off of that island. They would force them into a 17-foot speedboat, and they would leave the island. Severa Gamero, uh, the third American, was an American businessman uh, who was on the island vacationing. As I said earlier, they would travel over 300 miles. Uh, uh, across the open Zulu Sea. About halfway across the ocean, uh, they had pre-planted on a very, very small island a fish, a, lo a little bit larger fishing boat, probably about a 30-foot fishing boat, maybe 28 foot. Uh, but still, that's pretty crowded when you put uh, 20 plus another uh, five or six people. So 25 people on a 25-foot boat has a tendency to not leave you much privacy to do anything uh, at, at all. Well, this is a list of the hostages that were taken uh, on down uh, through 
Um, I won't leave that up uh, right now. We can come back to it later on. Uh, and then another picture of um, Martin and Gracia. Um, and, and what I want you to note, uh, if you will, in these pictures of Martin and Gracia, they were pretty healthy people. I mean, they were not skin and bone type people. They had pretty good builds on them. So as we go through this uh, incident this evening, we'll begin to see very shortly their health begin uh, to deteriorate. Martin and Gracia had been born and raised in Kansas. Uh, they had met in college and married. Martin was a missionary pilot. He flew a small Cessna airplane, hopping from island to island, delivering people, delivering supplies. Uh, Gracia stayed back at base camp, ran the radio, raised three children. Now, uh, Jeffrey, Mindy, and Zach, their life was committed to the people of the Philippines uh, and to their mission field. As uh, per pre-planned uh, instructions that remain on file at most mission fields, on May 27, 2001, Paul and Aretta Burnham, parents of Martin Burnham, were telephonically contacted advising them of the kidnapping. The New Tribes Mission immediately, with, with concert of the State Department, evacuated the children back to the United States. There would be no doubt in our minds that there would be no quick resolution uh, to this particular incident. The Abu Sayyaf. Well, we see Abu Sabea. Uh, he was kind of the head dog in, in this particular operation. Uh, Hasarani Sali. Uh, he was in and out of camp, not really that significant of a player. He was doing other things with the government. Gaddafi John Jelani. Uh, he was in and out of the camp. Uh, most, uh, most every week. Uh, Abu Salman, uh, he was kind of looked upon as an elder, kind of a statesman, kind of a, a wheeler dealer. Um, and then uh, Islan Hapalan, and we'll hear Islan Hapalan's uh, name here again in, in the very near future. The Abu Sayyaf was a terrorist organization of devout Muslims committed along with several other terrorist organizations in trying to turn the island of Mindanao into an independent Muslim country, uh, which would be totally separate from the Philippine government. So every once in a while I run into friends who say, uh, gosh, we've got some missionaries on the island of Mindanao, we're thinking about go visiting them. And uh, I look at them and I say, are you nuts? You do not want to go to the island of Mindanao. Oh, it's not that bad. It's not as bad as people say. Trust me, ladies and gentlemen, it, it, it's as bad as people say. The Abu Sayyaf was financially funded by the son-in-law of a new terrorist called Osama bin Laden. A relatively unheard terrorist at this point who had fought the Russians in Afghanistan on behalf of the CIA. And after the Russians withdrew from Afghanistan, Osama bin Laden got the idea of maybe forming his own terrorist organization, so he called it the base, uh, i.e. Al-Qaeda. Uh, this is just a roster of all the different uh, Abu Sayyaf people that came in and out of camp. Uh, at any one time, there was probably six or seven uh, soldiers in camp and the ones on the poster were the primary leaders. Uh, uh, today most of those names are dead. At least we accomplished a little bit. Uh, a few of them are in captivity and a few of them are, are aimlessly wandering, wandering around the uh, jungles of Basilan trying to figure out what happened about five years ago. So. The Filipino government at that time was headed by President Arroyo. Uh, the country of the Philippines and the Philippine government can best be described as being pretty much totally corrupt. Not much gets done in the Philippines unless you're working <laughs> under the table, not on top of the table. President Arroyo uh, had been educated in the United States and of all things had become friends to Bill Clinton. No wonder she was incompetent. That, that explains part of it right there. Goodness <laughs> sakes. You know. 
Uh, she had only been president for six months. She had come into the presidency in January of 2001 after there was a coup and President Estrada had been ousted. Uh, in 2007, six years after this incident, President Arroyo would be arrested for stealing eight million dollars from a children's rehabilitation government fund. Shows you what an outstanding uh, leader that she was and was confined in a military confinement for five years. Uh, she basically did nothing, and I really mean absolutely nothing, to enhance uh, or to assist or encourage the negotiation process in 13 months. Uh, she continually made inflammatory and boisterous headlines in the paper uh, threatening the Abu Sayyaf. Uh, she refused to meet and or correspond for the most part with our State Department uh, and or the negotiation teams and the negotiation unit. I'll share with you an example of her comments two days after the kidnapping. May 28, 2001, President Arroyo appears on national television. And this is what she says, I have declared an all-out war on the Abu Sayyaf, stating she will finish them and she will finish what they started. Well, it sounds pretty tough for the President of the Philippines, but it doesn't do much to enhance negotiations. Uh, good morning, Abu Sayyaf. Uh, you know, we're here to help you. <laughs> you can trust us, you know. <laughs> now, uh, uh, Gloria undermined just about everything we did. The hostages. It? We missed the hostages. All right? We're not going to show you the hostages. You just have to believe that they're there. Okay. <laughs> May 28, 2001, FBI headquarters is notified of the kidnapping. FBI Quantico is the home of our negotiation unit. They were advised. There we have eight full-time uh, supervisor uh, negotiators that do the research, uh, the development, uh, the training. Uh, they are the first responders to all major incidents within the United States. Uh, and uh, most of the time, uh, when we have a critical incident outside the United States, one of them will go immediately but after that, they like to come back home. Uh, they, they, they don't like prolonged periods of travel, and since they're the bosses, they don't have to do it. They send the, the little guys to do the dirty work. And so, if there's any uh, consolation tonight, you can, you can depend on one thing. If you're ever kidnapped outside the United States and the FBI can gain entry into that country, relax, hold your breath, try to eat a little bit, we'll be coming for you. Okay. Now, it may take us a while to get you out, so don't get your hopes up too much too quick. Uh, but we'll be on the ground and we'll be establishing a negotiation network. Because no one knew on May 27th, 28th, where the hostages were, um, we could not deploy our negotiators, so we, would, we held them off until about the 8th to 10th of June, and at this time, the supervisory agent. Uh, traveled uh, to uh, the U.S. Embassy in Manila to set up a negotiation base. Uh, I would uh, deploy solo to Manila on June 16th to join the supervisor and to begin to uh, develop our strategy, our techniques, our, uh, our tactics that we were going to try to use uh, in uh, effectively communicating with the Abu Sayyaf. Uh, in early July, about the second week of July, I had been in country a little over two weeks, maybe almost three weeks, uh, we did receive uh, some communication from the uh, Abu Sayyaf uh, that they had beheaded uh, Sabero Gamero. Uh, they had not liked Sabero. Uh, he he uh, had a tendency to be a little bit uh, disrespectful, uh, and didn't really want to follow their rules, uh, and uh, and uh, they, they found out that he was on the island of Los Dosimos, not with his wife, who he was not divorced from, uh, but with a girlfriend from uh, Manila. And so, uh, although they often failed to strictly follow the Koran, uh, in this instance, this was a good reason to kill an American, okay? Um, and uh, the Abu Sayyaf, um, 
but justified their actions by blaming President Arroyo, who had indeed refused to really even talk to them at all. Uh, they advised the world that this was their thank you gift for her actions. Uh, and then just to rub a little salt into the injury, uh, they demanded $100,000 for the body of Severo. Uh, we already said the United States doesn't pay ransom, okay? And we're certainly not going to pay ransom for a dead body. Uh, that, that, that sounds easy to say, and, and, and it makes sense. But uh, rest assured, within the next few days, it became a, what I used to tell the bosses, this is, a, this is not a stressful day, this is a super stressful day. Uh, we were still fighting to establish continual uh, communications with the Abu Sayyaf, and at the same time, uh, we were put in a position to console the arriving Gamero family that had arrived unannounced uh, at the United States Embassy in Manila. It would be one of several uh, emotional conferences uh, with the Gabero family and then later with the, uh, the Burnham families. And in this instance, we were trying to explain to them as well as we could as to why the United States does not pay ransom for dead bodies. Well, at times this kind of felt overwhelming being in this position uh, so far away from home. Uh, the FBI, we, we did have somewhat of a blueprint. Two years prior to this incident, uh, we had a, for lack of better terminology, a stupid American uh, that was over in the Philippines on the island of Mindanao running his mouth and he got taken hostage by the Abu Sayyaf. Uh, and so uh, we had negotiated nine months for his release. Uh, we had used some governmental officials in that release. Uh, and so uh, 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 eventually uh, Jeffrey Schilling was his name, was released successfully back to the, the United States. Uh, uh, and this was, of course, under the uh, presidency of President Estrada. Uh, information flowed considerably better under President Estrada than under uh, the new president. November 11th, 2001. Some of you may recall that, day. Eh? Al-Qaeda attacks the United States. Well, as you can imagine, this certainly emboldened the Abu Sayyaf. And most communications with them was immediately cut by them, not by us. Uh, and it would take a while before we were able to reestablish communication lines. Although our direct communications were somewhat non-existent, the FBI and other government agencies went into what I call hyperactivity planning modes, and we developed a new asset. Uh, now, I smile about this because I, I, I really thought it was kind of clever. Uh, we developed an asset by the name of Arlene De La Cruz, who was a news reporter for channel, uh, TV Channel 25 in Manila. And she agreed to assist us. Uh, she had grown up on the, on the island of Mindanao part of her life, and lo and behold, uh, she had had a long time childhood, teenage years, not romantic, but just a good friendship relationship with none other than Isalan Hapalan. Remember the ugly guy in the second row of the pictures? Yeah, that's the guy. Uh, so she, um, she reached out to him and said, hey, I, I would like to come and interview you on the island. And so through classified negotiations, it was arranged for TV25 uh, to pay the Abu Sayyaf for a secret in the jungle interview with the Abu Sayyaf leaders uh, and to be able to talk to Martin and Gracia. Uh, and uh, they, they, they thought that was a good idea. Any type of, anytime they could turn something for money, the, the, the Filipino is listening, okay? 
And so she was secreted in and out of the jungle, and she convinced them while she was there, well, she was a slick talker. She was even better than most negotiators. She convinced them that CNN would probably pay $2 million for this video, and so that the money would be on the way shortly, okay? Wow, I'm talking about going fishing. Ooh, she didn't even need bait. Yes. Flung the hook out there, and they snapped it. Well, the great thing about the videotape was that it was our absolute first proof of life. Uh, the bad thing about the interview, it confirmed our worst nightmares that Martin and Gracia were critically ill and in fact probably starving to death. If you look at the picture uh, on the, the, the book and the picture that was up before we got started today, uh, that was Mark and Gracia after seven months in captivity. Uh, the video uh, also uh, was able to give us some much needed intel. Uh, we were able to determine how many hostages were still remaining in camp, how many Abu Sayyaf soldiers were normally in camp, uh, the type of weapons that they had, the type of restraints that they had on Martin and Gracia. Uh, all those things are important uh, if, in fact, uh, there comes a time, a day, uh, that we have to try to rescue uh, if, if we cannot successfully negotiate. Well, I, I, I put up this flow chart because information runs both ways, as you know, in any type of flow chart. And so if you look at our government, it starts with the President of the United States, and in the case of these types of international incidents, State Department obviously is involved, the embassy is involved in the Philippines, and with just our luck, uh, the ambassador to the Philippines had just been called back to the United States for another assignment, so we had an acting ambassador. An acting ambassador is almost as bad as no ambassador, because they don't want to make any tough decisions because they're afraid it's going to affect their careers. And so this didn't help the situation either. You have the Department of Defense, those guys I like. Because they don't ask a lot of questions, Lenny. I mean, they just tell you what they're going to do, and then they go do it. Uh, Lenny's my good friend who t uh, we sat beside each other uh, as adjunct professors preparing our lesson plans. And if I'm not mistaken, you, you in the Army? A Green Berets? Yeah, see, so uh, we have some heated discussions about the value of the Marine Corps and the value of the Army uh, just about every morning, don't we, Lenny? Uh, in late November 2001, I'm back in the Philippines, and I'm instructed to write another document that is called a negotiation position paper. This is something that the head negotiator had to write about every two weeks as to what, ha what, what has gone on in the last few weeks, uh, what's the new recommendations, and how successful are these new recommendations likely to work. I never really enjoyed writing these darn papers. And I, uh, the problem was there was a 12-hour difference between the Philippines and Washington, D.C. So at, uh, I would call the supervisor and say, hey, I want to go over this position paper with you. And, and uh, the, the secretary or somebody would say, well, he'll call you back. Uh, you know, he's in a meeting. And so he would call me back at 10 o'clock in the morning. His time. That's 10 o'clock at night, my time. I want to go to bed. And he wants to yak for two or three hours. Okay. And so there came a point in time with this particular negotiation paper, I said, hey, Gary, just write the damn paper and sign my name. Okay, he said, no, I'm sending it back for you. I want you to do all the work. Let me tell you why. He's not as dumb as he sounded. The reason I'm not fond of authoring such reports is because eventually they're going to go to the director of the FBI and then they're going to go up to the President of the United States and he's going to disseminate it to the Defense Department and the State Department. And I note that these writings often result in the author having to appear before subcommittees in the Congress. You've seen how some of those idiots have been working the last few months. 
And I knew if something went wrong, that's exactly where I would be. And so, this was my opening statement in my negotiation paper. Quote, recommendations immediate. Cease all deployment of crisis negotiators from the CERB CNU to the United States Embassy, Manila, Philippines, uh, Manila, Philippines, based on the following circumstances. Uh, those circumstances remain today classified, uh, but I knew uh, uh, with somewhat of a heavy heart that my career as a special agent uh, might well be on the line in the weeks ahead. With Ramadan and, and Christmas approaching, uh, I was the last negotiator out of the Philippines uh, in the first week of December. Uh, we all came back home and thereafter we met in several uh, conferences over the holidays in the first week of January to try to plot a new course of strategy. And so the second week of January, our new course of, 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 uh, of action would be, our new strategy was to send a primary crisis negotiator uh, uh, from the unit back to Manila in the, in the role as the chief financial officer of the new tribe's mission. Because the new tribe's mission had refused to offer anything as way of negotiations. Limited negotiations ensued for about six to seven weeks and we reached a tentative agreement to pay the Abu Sayyaf not two million dollars but eighty-five thousand. So we, we had we had made considerable progress. Now we already said the United States government does not pay ransom. And certainly Martin Gracia didn't have any money and, and quite frankly needed the new tribe's mission field. And so a very wealthy American citizen donated that money, $85,000, to the Burnham family to secure their release. Well, we've been at this for a while, like 15 years. And uh, as a negotiator, or as a negotiating team, not just me, but we thought this was a deal too good to be true. Uh, we, we feared a double cross. And uh, the Abu Sayyaf didn't let us down. <laughs> they double-crossed us. <laughs> we did live in the money, uh, $85,000 on one boat uh, going into Mindanao. Um, and then uh, they were to release, I mean, from Mindanao towards Basilan, and they were to release Martin and Gracia in the other boat to come into Mindanao. Uh, when they got to, uh, to the boat uh, uh, to load Martin and Gracia, uh, the, the Abu Sayyaf uh, changed their story and they said, now there's been a misunderstanding. We're on the radios and the satellite phones. They said, there's been a misunderstanding. And that 85,000 was only for one of the hostages, not two. Uh, and we knew, they knew, I'm not sure they knew, but we knew that Martin and Gracia were not going to separate. Either they would both come home or did you both go back into captivity? And so Martin Gracia returned to the jungles of Barcelona. The good news was that what few spies we had on the island of Barcelona told us that food and supplies were pouring into the island in certain locations. And then we was able to secrete some messages out that a better food medicine, uh, personal sanitary items uh, to keep yourself clean and healthy had reached the camp. Uh, and so if there was any good news that came out of this for $85,000, we kept Martin and Gracia alive. Meanwhile, the United States military, you gotta love those boys, ordered 660 elite U.S. armed Army Special Forces, I hate to say that word, Army Special Forces to be secreted in an unknown base on the Philippine Islands. Uh, we, were, um, we were upbeat about this as a negotiating team. We knew their capabilities. Uh, we were upbeat for about 36 hours and then President Arroyo announced on national television that she was refusing to let U.S. troops initiate any military action on her homeland, that they could only assist her elite terrorist 
anti-terrorist forces. Oh my God. I dare say President Bush had been far too kind to this woman. Uh, she was playing cards that she had accumulated during 9-11, uh, right after the attacks of 9-11, uh, Aurorio was at least smart enough to immediately contact uh, President Bush and say, hey, whatever you need from the Philippine government, you can have. You know, we stand behind the United States government. You are our ally. We will do anything for you. Except let your forces rescue American hostages on our soil. But, you know, so... If I have a distaste for President Arroyo in my mouth, you'll have to forgive me. Well, the final chapter. June 6, 2002, 13 months later, the United States Embassy is advised by the Philippine government that they have tracked and surrounded the Abu Sayyaf in one of their camps in the jungle. They plan a rescue scheduled for the following morning, June 7th. American Special Forces were put on high alert, as were our negotiating teams. 6 a.m. June 7th, the Philippine Army did in initiate an attack on the Abu Sayyaf camp. Within three minutes of the attack, Gracia Burnham had been shot once, critically wounded by friendly fire. The only other remaining hostage, Evadora Yap, had been killed by friendly fire. Mark Burton, Martin Burnham had been shot three times by friendly fire. He lay dead on the jungle floor. U.S. Special Forces arrived with their medevac helicopters. They administered aid to Gracia, was able to stabilize her evacuate her to the U.S. hospital at the embassy in Manila. And it was over. The 13 months had come to an end. It wasn't a rescue. It wasn't an attack. It was an assault with no discipline. And so for me, uh, in just a post note, June 7, 2002, I was not in the Philippines. I and three other negotiators had been deployed to Russia to conduct some top-level terrorist negotiation training to the FSS, Federal Special Forces uh, Services. Uh, you may not recognize that that terminology, FSS, uh, they used to be called the KGB. So uh, this was some uh, specialized training that they needed and we felt that they needed to have. Uh, late on the evening of June 7th, I received a call from my supervisor, Gary Nesner, who shared the news of that day. In the moments following, I, I gathered uh, the negotiation team that was in Moscow with me and shared the devast devastating news and several of them uh, on that team were, had also been negotiators uh, to the Philippines. And we, we kind of wondered aloud uh, with each other as, would we really be ever able as individuals, having gone through that, to be able to negotiate again? So having said all that, in seven minutes more than I intended to, which is pretty darn good for me, Right, brother? Did you say within seven minutes of what I said I was going to... we'd be here at least three hours. Well, we may be. It's not over yet. I mean, you know. Uh, so, uh, where's Lynette? Here. Ah! Here. Uh, so, I think Lynette is going to stalk the audience. Yes. And, and you're going to be allowed to ask questions or give answers. <laughs> uh, you know, if you have answers, I'll take them. I, mean, I, I still may need them in the future sometimes, so... <laughs> Uh, so, uh, if you have a, a question, please raise your hand. Lynette can come to you, uh, and, uh, and uh, we can hear what you have to say. Uh, 
Uh, Mr. Steele, were you ever, did you ever get to meet Gracia Bennett, um, Vernon? I'm, I'm sorry, say that again. Did you ever get to meet Gracia? Oh, okay. Uh, did I ever get to meet Gracia Burnham? Uh, I met Gracia twice. Uh, six months after she came back to the States, uh, we held a uh, day-long debriefing with Gracia uh, back in Washington, D.C. And then about uh, seven years later, which would have been about seven years ago, uh, Gracia was invited uh, to make a presentation at the uh, Liberty uh, Church uh, in Chesterton uh, to a ladies or organization and uh, so uh, Gracia, uh, I had reached out to Gracia and said hey you're going to be like uh, 10 miles from me and she said oh I, I want you to come to the luncheon and so I show up at the Liberty Church and uh, there's like uh, these uh, German ladies at the door hey Emma, uh, stop I go uh, you know they said no men allowed this is strictly a women's affair I said uh, you know I've been invited by the Guest speaker, Gracia. We have not heard of this. You do not enter. I'm going, Jesus. Okay. That took me 15 minutes to get. I, I can get cleared. By, I can get cleared to go into the Philippines quicker. I can get cleared to go into the Liberty Church. But they, they, they finally got it. Finally, Gracia walks down the hallway, uh, and uh, God bless her. She made full recovery from her wounds, and uh, she gave me the yeah. The, the, let the guy come in. I mean, look at him. He's harmless. He's old. <laughs> I mean, you know. So, yeah. More questions. Is that organization still active? The Abu Sayyaf? Yeah, you'll read about them once in a while. They still do a raid once in a while. But they, obviously, they don't have the funding. Uh, and so now they're just putzing along uh, with two other uh, uh, terrorist organizations, the MILF and the ML. PN, I think, are two other terrorist organizations that are trying to overthrow the government. So before you went there, you were aware of them and you knew about them and you knew it was all about the purpose of what they're trying to do? Well, we knew they were trying to overthrow the government, revolutionaries, terrorists, whatever terminology we went on. We didn't know they were being uh, uh, financed by Osama, Osama bin Laden's son-in-law. The name at that time didn't, you know, didn't ring a bell to us, uh, the name of the son-in-law, uh, you know, so. Yes, sir. I don't think I need a mic. I can talk about it. Oh. <laughs> um, what? Is more, <laughs> this is more of a question of curiosity, but what made you want to be um, an agent? Uh, what made me want to be an agent? Um, <laughs> money. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, really, you know, uh, I, my, my college degree is business economics and accounting. I never once thought about going into uh, to law enforcement in, in, until about six months before I graduated from college. And, and then I, I, I was a member of the LaPorte County Police Department. And, uh, very frankly, my goal with the LaPorte County Police Department was to be the sheriff of LaPorte County one day. Uh, I had never thought about the FBI. I mean, really, the FBI. Get serious. You know, I, I'm a country kid from LaPorte. Okay? And one day an FBI agent uh, visited me and he said, you ever think about joining the FBI? And I said, no. And he said, uh, if I left an application, would you think about filling it out? Uh, I said, how long is it? He said, 20, 22 pages. We didn't have computers then, right? I said, yeah, you can leave it. I'll, I'll take a look at it. And so this guy was slick. He said, I understand you got a college degree. I said, yeah. You know, he says, somebody told me you had a master's degree. I go, yeah. He said, so he gets up and he says, well, Dave, I appreciate you talking to you. And so he gets to the door and then he stops and he gives me the old FBI pose, right? And he goes, can I ask you one last question? He said, how much money are you making as a sergeant, jail commander of LaPorte County Police Department? He knew how much money I was making, the dirt bag. <laughs> I said, hey, I'm making $16,800 a year. He said, I don't know if this will make any difference or not. Starting pay with the FBI right now is about 42000 I said, Mr. Quigley, if you can stop by tomorrow morning, I'll have that damn uh, application filled out for you. <laughs> and that's how I became an agent. Any other questions? Oh, Lenny. What in the I can't believe you need the mic. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the screen is going to have to hassle a uh, Brian here. 
Uh, in, in the couple minutes you have left, uh, the stories you and I have shared, uh, could you give the audience uh, just a little bit of an overview of a couple of serial killers that you went after and caught? Oh. Well, uh, to make a long story short, uh, sometime in the fall of uh, 2020, uh, probably late September, early October, the Oxygen Channel, there's a program called SNAP, uh, where they show all these vicious female killers. And there's going to be a, 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 a segment on there of a, a female serial killer out of Anniston, Alabama, by the name of Audrey Marie Hilly. Uh, I was involved uh, with the Vermont State Police and the New Hampshire State Police of her arrest uh, when I was stationed in Vermont. Um, Vermont was an interesting place. I, uh, I, I ran into another serial killer in Vermont, Captain David John Seiger, who was hanging out up on the uh, ski mountains, uh, you know, and uh, so we got word, and uh, again, Vermont State Police did most of the work, uh, but uh, again, uh, well, because in Vermont there was only five agents in the whole state, uh, you know, uh, so it wasn't like we had a SWAT team or anything, I mean, you know. Uh, and so, so that was two of the cases we had. And then, of course, some of the older folks in here will remember the horrific Lorraine Kirkley, David Malinsky uh, kidnapping, sexual assault, murder case here in Balfour, uh, Porter County asked uh, myself and my partner to work on that case. Uh, David Malinsky was not a, 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 a quote, uh, serial killer, but he was a serial killer to be. But most people don't know that David Malinsky had stalked and tracked a nurse out of St. Catherine's Hospital in East Chicago uh, and had planned to kill her, uh, and he got fired, or he was asked to leave the hospital. He did not get fired. And so he left that hospital, and of course, he came to Porter where they, you know, so they look at his employment record at St. Catherine's, and they said, you know, he just left. <laughs> yeah, right. And so a year later, uh, Lorraine is killed. Most serial killers don't start killing until about the age of uh, between 28 and 32. So David was prime time, he was I think 28 or 29. He was just coming into his first kills. Any other questions? I got one. Why is that? Do they know why serial killers start at approximately that age? A lot of it has to do with the fantasy of serial killing. Uh, it takes them uh, three to five years uh, to process through the different stages in their brain of this, this fantasy of, you know, practicing the kill and, and making everything right. Uh, and then, uh, you know, once they do their first kill, then it's a whole other game as to how frequently they're going to kill. Uh, one thing we know, they are going to kill again because the, the actual kill is never as exciting as the fantasy, you know. You can fantasize and everything's perfect. Oh, this is going to happen, this is going to happen, this is going to happen. And then when you do the kill, you, th those things haven't happened. And so the need is still there. It's just how long are they going to fantasize again before they do their next kill? That was horrible. Oh, that was horrible. Are you okay? Yeah, okay. I just don't know what I was thinking of. Uh -huh. It's a good thing there's no more. Are there any more questions as to why I did that? I just, I'm old. I lose my balance. I think it was a workman's comp. Yeah, good. Workman's comp? Yeah, I could, I could sue. There was no stop signs here. <laughs> When she gave me some, would you like to do a talk? I said, hell yeah, I'll do a talk. And then she said, well, what do you want to talk about? And I said, oh, I don't know. So then I said, well, maybe I'll talk about the Philippines, because I've never talked publicly about the Philippines. I've mentioned it a few times in some of my classes, just a little bit, but I've never given a detailed half-hour talk about the Philippines. And so, uh, yeah, you know, uh, Lynette would come by about every two days and hold my hand and bring me bottles of water and give me breathing exercises. You okay, you going to be able to do this? You know. So uh, th 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 this was not a particularly easy presentation for me. Uh, um, of course, none of them are when you lose. 
you know, I was in, uh, spent quite a bit of time in Colombia. Rebecca is mine, I've adopted her, and Sonia, wave your hand, March 30th, we go to court to finalize the adoption. So, now uh, I teach, When I did all my final retirement plans to get out of the FBI, uh, these little critters were not around. So they were not in my financial plan. <laughs> Had the little critters not come along, you would not be sipping pina colada someplace. It would yeah. not be yeah. in North. Yeah. <laughs> not, not the Philippines. Uh, and not Northwest Indiana. But, uh, they are a blessing. I wouldn't change a thing. I've enjoyed my tenure here. <laughs> at uh, Ivy Tech. Uh, it's been a good fit for me. Uh, and uh, so, you know, besides that, the wife doesn't want me home. Eight hours a day. <laughs> she can say what she wants to, but deep down, she does not want me home eight hours a day. Yes, there's a lot of murders in Chicago. Do you think there's really maybe a serial killers involved in that? Uh, most of those, no. Uh, if, if you break down and take a hard look at those murders, uh, most of those are black on black. Uh, and a lot of it's driven by gangs and drugs. Now, I'm not saying there isn't a, a serial killer, perhaps someplace on the south side. I know that about 15 years ago we had a, a male serial killer killing prostitutes, but I, uh, that, that, that particular serial killer was solved. But yeah, th there may be a few of them attributed to that, but, but certainly not the most. Um, basically, what happened in Chicago, they had a great community policing uh, program. Excuse me. Uh, starting in the mid-1990s, uh, and that program ran exceptionally well for 10 years. They got a new superintendent of the police, and he said, hey, I want to put my emphasis other places, and for the next five or six years, that program began to crumble, and in the last three years, you've seen the results of a non-effective community policing program, and now they're trying to reestablish it. It looks like they may have turned the corner there a little bit. Uh, homicides were down last year. Uh, and they got some new programs coming out that, that they hope will be successful this year. So, what's the chance that they may call you back? Uh, the FBI, a uh, zero. <laughs> uh, not that I wouldn't go. Uh, no, uh, but uh, it, with the FBI, uh, it's 57 mandatory retirement. You're out. You're done. Uh, there's a young guy right behind you that's just as smart, if not smarter. They don't need you. And I, and I hear uh, some of the old agents say, oh man, these young guys. Hey, listen, I'm glad I got in the FBI when I did, because if I had to go against these young guys, uh, the average age of an uh, FBI class today is 40, usually 40 guys, 40 men and women in a class. Uh, the average age of the class is somewhere between 29 and 31, uh, and over 75% of them will take a $50,000 or more pay cut to come to the FBI. You think these people aren't sharp? <laughs> ah, they, they look, make me look like kindergarten. Yeah. They really do. The FBI is in good hands. I believe that. We have time for one more question. Does anyone want to volunteer a question? None of those doggone bright students back there on the right hand side now. Come on, don't disappoint me. <laughs> don't act like my class. <laughs> <laughs> So what part of your job do you miss the most in the FBI? Uh, probably uh, the camaraderie of, 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 you know, of, of certain agents that, that I worked a long time with. Uh, certainly the friendships uh, that I developed in the crisis negotiation unit back at Quantico. Uh, you know, uh, and then even here, uh, you know. So I spent uh, a little over two years in Vermont. If you've never been to Vermont, you need to go. It's a beautiful state. It really is. People suck. <laughs> I mean, all they want is your money. They love tourists. Come stay for two weeks, drop all your money, then go back to the flatlands. Because we don't want you here in the mountains. Uh, you know, so. Uh, all right, thank you all, and thank you, Jason. This episode of The Bill and Callie Show is brought to you by Tiger Plumbing. Whether you need to replace a faucet, 
overhaul your sump pump, or desludge your drains. Call Tiger Plumbing. In today's world, knowing who's at your door is important. Tiger Plumbing sends you your technician's photo, estimated time of arrival, and a little bit about him or her. Hey, Sam likes fishing and camping. Cool. <laughs>